Welcome, dear listener, to the book tower. It's cold outside, so why not sit with me by the fire for just a short time? I have here a lesser-known apocalyptic short story for you, published by the British Library. It's called The End of the World and was written by Helen Sutherland. I have dreamed a dream, and the manner of my dreaming was thus. I stood on a high place, overlooking the nations of the world. I beheld them arise from the chaos occasioned by the Third World War, and saw that they strove yet once again to build up a world peace. And I saw in my dream that the populations of the world had undergone a change. I saw women in offices, women in factories, women in workshops, in greater number than had ever before been known. The vehicles that whirled up and down the roadways of town and country, the trains and the various aircraft that winged their ways across the face of the sky were all in the power of women. I saw men grown arrogant by reason of their exceeding scarcity. Like sultans, they strode about amongst a mass of womankind, issuing orders, exacting homage, expecting and receiving obedience and devotion wherever they went. They married and had children, but of those families it was the female sex that predominated. Daughters, aunts, sisters, mothers, grandmothers. All these increased and multiplied mightily. But of sons, uncles, brothers, fathers and grandfathers, there was a very great falling off. The seasons came and went. And lo, it was winter, and I saw a winged blackness appear over the rim of the world. So black was the apparition that the sun and the moon were darkened, and so mighty were its pinions that in a little space they had borne the blackness over all the nations of the earth. Now this winged horror was plague, and I saw in my dream that the peoples of every nation were stricken down in their hundreds and in their thousands. But when, after a time, the darkness cleared from off the face of the earth, lo, it was the males of every nation that had succumbed. Then, in my dream, I looked down into the bowels of the earth, into the coal mines, the ore mines, and into the secret places where precious gems lay hid, and there were women there. I looked upon the swift ships as they sped here and there over the waters of the world, and down below the waters where fair pearls are to be found, lo, there were women there also. In the fields and in the vineyards, and upon the hillsides where grazed the herds and the flocks, there were women there also. Then, in my dream, did all the great nations of the earth make a decree that every man from every city, town, or village should meet in one place and discuss with the wisest and most learned in the land how they might avert the approaching disaster that threatened the world in the declining of its male populations. It was determined therefore, that the meeting place for the immense convocation should be a certain island in the mid-Pacific, as being the spot most convenient for every nation. From all parts of the earth they came, and it was a great marvel to see so many men gathered together at one time in one place. The sky above the island was dark, with aircraft of every description, and the women therein gazed down with eager, marvelling eyes at a sight so exceedingly strange. 
and I saw in my dream that a great storm arose and blew across the ocean, lashing its waters to white-foamed fury and wrecking very many of the aircraft that kept their vigil over the island. And a great earthquake shook the island to its foundations. Buildings fell with the noise of thunder, the earth heaved and cracked, and the vast halls in which was gathered the flower of the world's manhood tottered and crashed to utter ruin. Then did I perceive that there was a great consternation amongst the women of the world, and the sound of their wailing rose on the wind. For now there were scarce a hundred thousand men left on the earth. Nor did the rising generations bring any comfort into the desolate hearts of that vast population of women, since for every fifty children born to them, only one was a boy. Then were laws passed, whereby a man should have wives in great number, and the women of sons was honoured above all women. From being as sultans and lords of the earth, men, so I saw in my dream, became household treasures, cherished specimens. So overwhelmed did they become by the great forces of the opposite sex, that when a man met a man, he scarce knew what to say, or how to conduct himself towards his fellow male. Nor was any male allowed to go forth without a bodyguard of women, and every precaution that desperate brains could devise was taken in order to preserve the steadily decreasing male element throughout the world. The seasons came and went. I looked once more upon the earth. Then in my dream I beheld women in the law courts and in the robes of judges, magistrates, and all other dignitaries of the law. Women I beheld in the pulpits of the world and in the offices of the church, high or low. I turned to governments and parliaments of the nations. Here too, my eyes beheld naught but women. Women sat on the chairs of presidents, on the seats of dictators, nay, on the very thrones of kings. And even as I looked, the male element of the human world dwindled and decreased. Further laws were passed whereby a man-child, on the completion of his third year, became the property of the state. Large sums were paid for the country's coffers to the parents of the young male, and his education and subsequent career were thereafter entirely in the hands of the state. Societies were formed, researches made, and experiments undertaken by the greatest scientists to discover the means of preserving and increasing mankind. Then in my dream I became aware that no more men children were being born in the world. So great was the atmosphere of feminism and so all-pervading was the female element that it seemed as if no male being could survive therein. The existing men grew old and one by one death claimed them. At length, so it appeared to me in my dream, a man-child was born. Beacons flamed the good tidings from every hill. Bells rang out from a thousand steeples. Aircraft wrote the happy news in letters of fire and smoke across the skies. Upon the mother of the child, whose husband had died at the age of sixty-nine in the preceding month, were bestowed the highest orders the most honourable titles that the nations of the world could give. The child was reared with infinite care, protected by every means that science could offer from the ills of babyhood, boyhood and adolescence. In so great esteem was he held, and so marvellous was this man, accounted in a world of women, that women from far and near flocked in endless pilgrimage to behold him. At the earliest possible age he was married, and in the following years vast palaces were built to house his retinue of wives. But as I watched, I saw no male issue bless these unions. The seasons came and went, and I beheld once more in my dream the nations of the earth, 
and lo, there arose a great cry of mourning through the lands, for the last man was lying desperately ill in one of the world's most famous hospitals. Without the gates of a hospital, I perceived an immense crowd of women, like a great sea troubled by storm and tempest. It heaved to and fro in the throes of anxiety and apprehension. Some women prayed, throwing up their arms in a frenzy of expectation. Others beat upon the mammoth doors of the hospital's wide outer court. Others waited in stony silence, their great eyes staring unseeingly at the balcony on the upper part of the vast building, inside which the last man, whitened with the snows of age, was lying. Then did I see in my dream that doctors of the highest skill and learning had been summoned from near and far, yea, from the very ends of the earth, in order that the life of the last man be prolonged. At length, so I saw, it was decided, after earnest discussion amongst these wise and skilful women, that only an operation of the most delicate and ingenious sort could save the patient. When it became known to the multitudes without a great silence fell over them, and in all the world was there no sound, only a vast, apprehensive silence. Then I beheld in my dream a woman, clothed in white, step out onto the balcony that overlooked the great crowd. Every eye was fixed on the famous surgeon, every ear strained to hear the result of the operation. Then did the words of the woman in white resound like the blast of trumpets, north and south and east and west. It is the end of the world.